Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today at City Club's June 10th Friday Forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, President of City Club, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here with us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KVPS radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today we are extremely pleased to welcome Congressman Kurt Schrader, but first a few announcements. First off, if you haven't already done so, you might want to silence your cell phones. City Club's corporate and media partners are especially vital in their support for the club's activities, and I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine. I'd also like to offer our appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors. Please join me in offering our sincere appreciation to our spring quarter sponsors, communications firm Morell Inc., utility company Northwest Natural, and the law firms of Perkins Coie and Schwabe Williamson and Wyatt. We are truly grateful for your support. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. Um, last week, I don't know how many of you were here, but last week we had a big crowd and we had a lot of stuff on our agenda. And I didn't get a chance to let people know about the PERS, a research study online poll that we had done in advance of the debate and voting last week. And I just wanted to let you know that City Club has been looking at whether there are new opportunities that we could do online voting for the club's research reports instead of just voting in the room on the day uh, uh, that the uh, debate happens. And the unofficial poll that happened on the PER study, 55% of those that responded to the poll agreed with all of the recommendations in the report. 38% agreed with some, but not all and 7% said they didn't agree with the report at all. And one of the things that was great about the, the poll was that a lot of people had some very thoughtful comments that they provided on the conclusions and the recommendations in the report. And those are going to be shared with the soon to be constituted PERS Advocacy Committee because last week we did vote overwhelmingly in support of the uh, report and so there is an advocacy committee that is being formed. And if you didn't get a chance, there's already been a lot of media attention to the report. If you didn't get a chance to hear Think Out Loud a couple of days ago, uh, they did a really good piece on PERS and Kathy, who was the writer on the report, was on for about 15 minutes. So you can go to the OPB website and listen to that. It was excellent. During today's question and answer session, members will, as always, be invited to the microphone after our speaker to ask their questions. But we are also um, inviting members and non-members alike to write a question for our speaker on one of the index cards that's on every table. And during the board host question, City Club staff will collect those cards and pick one or two excellent questions, which I will read from the microphone. And we're sure you're going to come up with some great questions for today's speaker. And now to our program. In the last decade, we've seen dramatic increases in federal deficits. The economic downturn and tax cuts have decreased revenue, while foreign war wars and recent stimulus measures have significantly increased spending. A long-term solution, which will likely require both tax reform and a hard look at our current spending priorities, will be necessary to reduce the gap between revenues and expenditures and to shrink the federal debt. Today, Congressman Kurt Schrader will discuss what Congress can do to balance the budget while also tackling our mounting debt. Kurt Schrader has worked for more than 20 years in public service. He served for many years on the Canby, Oregon Local Planning Board before being elected to the Oregon House of Representatives in 1996. He served there until 2003 when he was elected to the Oregon State Senate and appointed to chair the Joint Ways and Means Committee. He continued to serve in that capacity until he was elected to Congress in 2008 as representative for Oregon's 5th Congressional District. A small business owner himself, Representative Schrader currently serves as a member of the House Committee on Small Business and is a ranking member of the House Small Business Subcommittee on Finance and Tax. 
So without further ado, please help me welcome Congressman Kurt Schrader. Well, I want to thank you all for a warm welcome and the invitation to come before the City Club. Uh, I want to make it clear, I'm Congressman Kurt Schrader and I represent Oregon's 5th Congressional District. I'm not Anthony Weiner from New York, so you'll get no special tweets or Facebook pages from me. And I, those of you that are disappointed, I apologize up front. Uh, as Sharon indicated, uh, I'm a former Oregon State Senator and Ways and Means co-chair and had uh, helped guide our own state through some pretty tough times a few years ago. And uh, I thought it was really tough then and only to be presented with uh, the huge economic uh, collapse that we have faced in the last two, three years and the uh, uh, lack of awareness, it would seem like, of our own fiscal picture. Uh, as alluded uh, to by Sharon, we're engaged now in two wars. Well, three, I guess, if you include the Libyan conflict, which I don't think we can ignore. Uh, and we're going to have to confront terrorism around the globe for, for years to come. And I respect and understand that. And we focused on that, I think, since 9-11. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that, in my opinion, the greatest threat to America's security and welfare are not our enemies abroad. They're actually the impending economic disaster that you've heard talked about in recent times. If we do nothing about our federal deficit and our federal debt, we are headed, in my opinion, for a financial Armageddon that will make this last recession look like a blip on the radar screen. Last decade, we've seen dramatic increases in our federal deficits. The economic downturn and unpaid tax cuts have decreased our revenue, while foreign wars, policy lapses, and recent recovery measures have significantly increased our spending. A long-term solution is absolutely critical to reducing the gap between our revenues and expenditures and to shrink our federal debt. And I believe, like Sharon, that it will require both tax reform and a hard look at our current spending priorities. Bottom line is inaction is not an option. There are those in Congress that would rather do nothing. But I'll give you an example. Inaction means that in less than 14 years, less than a generation, the entire federal discretionary budget that encompasses both domestic and defense spending will be entirely taken up by our interest payments alone. So if we do nothing, we can kiss our kids and our grandkids' future goodbye. No money to educate them, no public safety, no defense spending, no roads and bridges, no environmental uh, assistance, no economic development. So, by way of background, what's our budget look like right now? Uh, right now, uh, as you have heard, and I've popularly heard at many town halls, our uh, debt is about $14 trillion, a little over $14 trillion, and scheduled to go higher because of ongoing payments that, that have to be made. That's more than $46,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. Our deficit for this year alone is $1.4 trillion. Currently, we're on track to spend about $3.7 trillion this year. Of that, about 60% goes to what we call mandatory programs. That's uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, support payments, both on food stamp side, ag subsidies. 40% uh, is what we call discretionary. To be particular, Social Security is about 19% of that. Medicare uh, is at 13% and Medicaid would be 7% of those totals. I'm a budget geek, so I gotta have some numbers in here. My staff fought me on this, but I'm gonna put some numbers out there. That 40% in discretionary spending uh, includes education, public safety, as I said, economic development, environment, infrastructure, and defense spending. Currently, defense spending is the larger of the two. It takes up about $715 billion or almost 58% of the discretionary portion of our budget. So we can't ignore defense spending. That leaves 520 some billion dollars, or just 14% of the total spending that goes into the domestic programs that I would argue in this state, in Oregon, are perhaps the most important. There's also, in my opinion, and I hope to correct that here today, a lot of confusion and misunderstanding on uh, you know, where the budget cuts need to be made and what we're actually doing. Uh, and I think also how much of our recent spending 
or tax breaks we've given away have contributed to our long-term debt versus our short-term deficits. And there is a difference, folks. If you turn on the television, you'll hear a lot of different reasons why our nation's $14 trillion in debt. Most of it is based on more mythology and misunderstanding than actual fact. They'll talk about the wars, they'll talk about the federal stimulus, they'll talk about tax cuts, elimination of our pay-as-you-go philosophy, and even last year's health care bill. And while all those are extremely expensive, most of those programs have contributed more to our short-term deficits than our long-term debt picture. And you'll see what I mean as I, I go on. Uh, the Recovery Act, good example, added significantly to our short-term debt. But I'd argue respectfully, without the investment of the Recovery Act, we'd still be headed down. We would have zero recovery at this point in time. We would still be going down. And uh, the short-term deficit before I even got to Congress was at about $1.2 to $1.3 trillion. Our national debt was already at $10.5 trillion. And the economy was heading down, as you've heard the popular phrase, at 600,000 jobs a month lost, lost. While the recovery is tepid at best, and I know a concern with many, perhaps everybody in this room, at least we've had private sector job growth for the last 15 months. When I got to Congress, uh, the Federal Reserve was basically out of ammunition. I'd argue they still are to some degree. Interest rates were near zero. I remember Ben Bernanke sitting across the table from me in my budget committee hearing, basically saying he had no more ammunition. There's nothing more he could do. We'd already gone through one quantitative easing, and the interest rates were still very low, and the economy still resisted recovery. So I'm a businessman. I you know, started my own veterinary clinic, built a farm up and stuff, and I realized you got to spend a little money to make some money, so I thought the Recovery Act made sense in the short term, even though it added to our short-term deficit because I could see the chart where that would all go away over you know, a short period of time, a couple, two, three years, hopefully keep our economy from going into depression, which I think we succeeded in, and then have to make uh, the tough decisions. If you want to spend a little up front, you got to make sure you manage the back end, and that's what we're trying to do now, and therein lies lots of the controversy. Everyone agrees that maybe we've got a problem. Well, not everybody, but most people agree we've got a problem. How do you go about it? What's the right mix and match to get things done? And also, how fast do you rein things in? Uh, do we do it overnight? Do we get back to 2008 spending levels you know, within the next uh, budget cycle? Or do we gradually get there? I think that at this stage, uh, you know, we have to be very careful about what we do. Uh, Oregon is not alone in the fragility of this recovery. Uh, I was just talking with Sharon and Pat, and my sense is like theirs that uh, most Oregon men and women and businesses are feeling slightly better now than they did a year ago about the future of this country, notwithstanding the last job numbers, if you will, from uh, the national government. Be curious what ours are next week. But uh, you know, generally, it's a little better off. Uh, businesses starting to make some investments. Some of the banks are able to lend. The regulators are backing off, at least when it comes to the mid and large sized companies. Not so much, unfortunately, with our smaller companies. And we're making some progress on some of the uh, short-term deficit issues I just talked about. Hopefully, we'll be stopping the war soon. Iraq, by the end of this year, the President's made some very strong commitments to that effect, and I'm, I'm actually very, very optimistic that will occur. Yeah. Afghanistan, uh, hopefully well before the 2014 deadline that's been talked about out there. And actually, as you saw in Congress last week, we actually had uh, a pretty good vote, pretty good bipartisan vote about getting ourselves out of Libya, either all together or in limiting whatever engagement we're in. And that was a nice bipartisan vote, so we're making some headway. And I think that will really help us in the short term. We spent over a trillion dollars in Iraq and Afghanistan, spending 10 billion bucks a month there right now. And that Afghanistan surge cost us about a million dollars per warrior we put in the field. I'd like to put that into American infrastructure. Iraq could pay its own way. And I can't help but put out uh, a little bit of a pushback on one of the most popular beliefs that the health care bill that was passed last session added so much to our debt and deficit. 
because uh, in reality, it actually reduces our deficit in the next 10 years by $143 billion plus. Actually, that's gone up in recent CBO estimates, and over a trillion dollars for the next 10 years. And uh, to, to put an emphasis on that, Congressman Ryan, in the Republican budget that was passed earlier this year, actually includes every single one of the reforms in Medicare uh, that we made in his budget. So while we were demonized last election cycle on that, apparently it looks pretty good this go round. So uh, I think that's validation that on proper reflection, you know, that some of those reforms are absolutely imperative to improve the longevity and the health of Medicare as we know it. There's still concern, you know, well, it's Congress. You know, you guys talk a good game and, yeah, Congressman Schrader, I hear what you're saying here. But uh, you're never going to be tough enough to enforce those Medicare improvements over the long haul. Some special interest group's going to get to you, and some extra tax break here and there. And, and I, you know, frankly, I think they have reason to be concerned. I tell you, I was shocked last uh, uh, November, I believe it was November, when uh, uh, the president and a significant majority of both houses voted for some budget busting, deficit busting tax breaks. I mean, it wasn't, you know, my idea of compromise is you figure out somewhere in between, you know, the tax breaks we talked about, well, we can't afford those for the, for the people earning more than $250,000 a year, you know, we should, you know, be somewhere in between. Well, we didn't do that. We did that, plus a whole bunch of other special tax breaks for a whole bunch of other folks, plus a bunch of other programs. And uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, you know, we added uh, $721 billion. 721 billion in cost. We also had added a bi uh, 400 billion dollars to our deficit for just one year alone as a result of that. So, it, you know, frankly, I think people's concern is warranted about where we're going to go. I didn't vote for that tax break, to be frank with you. I thought it was irresponsible given the fact the Fiscal Commission just a month before had showed very clearly that we were on a very unsustainable path. All right, so I've talked a little bit about the short-term cost drivers, I call them short-term, uh, that are adding to our short-term deficits. Well, why do you keep saying short-term? I mean, uh, what about the long-term? I, mean, I hear we're facing some bigger picture issues. That's true, and while each of these items I've talked about certainly plays into that, the biggest cost drivers are most of us in this room, the baby boomers. It's us. The cost of our entitlement programs our favorite entitlement programs that we all need and frankly have kept seniors out of poverty for a couple generations now, like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, the direct ag payments, food stamps, not necessarily all, all bad, all good programs are our big long-term debt drivers. If you look at the, the curves that we love to display in our budget committee hearings, you'll see a, a blip where we've increased our short-term deficits. They automatically go down to a half to two-thirds of that in the next four years, only to rise inexorably over a 30, 40 year horizon because of our increasing aging population and in particular our medical costs. Domestic and, uh, uh, excuse me, discretionary budget that includes, as I said before, both domestic and defense spending has to be reauthorized every year. Uh, without a budget or a resolution or an actual uh, act by Congress, Spending goes away altogether, so you actually have to do something every year to keep those programs going at whatever level you consider appropriate. The entitlement programs, as you are aware, grow automatically, and Congress has to intervene with statutory legislation to affect its spending trajectory. Social Security. Well, a lot of people say, well, Kurt, that's off budget, you know, we don't want to deal with that, you know, a great campaign issue, you know, but we really don't want to do anything substantive about that. Well, let me give some, some background to Social Security, and many in this room probably already know this, so I apologize. But when Franklin Roosevelt signed the Social, the Social Security Act into law in 1935, the average life expectancy was 64. The earliest retirement age in Social Security was 65. He's a pretty smart guy. <laughs> Today, Americans live an average of 14 years longer, retire three years earlier, and spend 20 years in retirement. In other words, demographic changes in our society 
have changed and put more stress on that fund than ever before. And we've borrowed heavily from that fund. So security is also facing a uh, difficult number problem when it comes to funding the fund. In 1950, there were 16 workers paying into the trust fund for every one beneficiary. That ratio has shrunk at an alarming rate to only three workers per beneficiary and expected by 2025, less than a generation from now, to drop to less than two and a half workers per beneficiary. At this rate, the trust fund will be completely drawn down by 2037 and we'll have only uh, the revenues that are coming in to live on and the fund itself takes an automatic 22% reduction. Every single senior in this country, some living on $700 to $1,000 a month because that's all they have is Social Security, will see their benefits reduced by 20-some percent if we do nothing at this point in time. Well, according to the Fiscal Commission the President put together, you know, that's not our biggest problem, if you will, in terms of the budget growth. Federal health care spending is our largest single challenge over the long run for some of the same reasons, living longer and healthier. We can also cure diseases we didn't even know existed 50 years ago. No chance on some of the cancers that now we can actually prolong life. HIV is no longer a death sentence, it's a chronic manageable disease. Our technology is unbelievable. I'd argue that in our country our knowledge is unsurpassed in healthcare. But we pay a premium for that. We pay two to three times as much as the rest of the industrialized world for our health care. Health care that arguably gives us no better health outcomes than the rest of the industrialized world. And the health care costs are growing faster than our economy. When I was in the state legislature, we budgeted health care inflationary costs at over 6%, very low beyond what it's really higher. Uh, we, uh, all other expenses, the inflation factor we allowed was in the 2% range. That cannot go on. Today, federal spending on health care is 6% of our economy, 6% of our gross domestic product. By 2035, it's going to be 10%. And of course, no end in sight as to that trajectory, given what we're doing here today. By 2020, uh, let me give you a, uh, here's a scary thought. By 2050, within many of our lifetimes out there, maybe not mine, but many of our kids, certainly and grandkids, by 2050, Social Security and federal health spending alone will exceed all our tax revenues. So we got a problem, folks. We got a big problem. Is this a legacy we're going to leave our kids and our grandchildren? I hope not. I hope not. So, okay, I've painted this doom and gloom picture. This is a little bit of an education session, if you will, and hopefully you'll talk to your friends and neighbors. You know, well, what do we do to get our fiscal house in order? What sort of, you know, political courage, uh, what sort of sacrifice, if you will, does each and every one of us have to make? Well, we started down a path uh, a few years ago with a Democratic president, a Republican Congress. We put in place at one point statutory pay-as-you-go. What does that mean? This was in the 1990s. Uh, basically, it was an important tool that curbed our discretionary and our entitlement spending, but required any changes to be paid for by either reducing spending or coming up with tax revenues. As I said before, Social Security, Medicare are direct spending programs. They are, operate largely on their own. And contrary to popular belief, each of them that we pay for in our monthly paychecks, the amount we pay, doesn't fund the program, pays about half of about Social Security and maybe a third of the actual Medicare costs long term. So the taxpayers are picking up a big, tab, big portion of the tab for both Social Security and Medicare. However, the benefits they dispense are automatic and I think the actuaries do a pretty good job of lining out you know, what the benefit payouts are going to cost us. Unfortunately, Congress just doesn't pay attention. That uh, statutory pay-go had been very successful over the years. It uh, actually, under Clinton and that Republican Congress, brought us from growing deficits from the prior Reagan and Bush years to an actual surplus of $236 billion by the year 2000. That policy required any increase in mandatory spending or tax reductions to be fully paid for and off or offset. And the company, they, at that time, they also had discretionary spending caps that limited how much Congress could appropriate each year for our domestic and defense programs. 
However, under the President Bush and subsequent Congress, PAYGO was lapsed. It was not reauthorized. The Bush tax cuts that we talk about were not paid for, added to the debt and deficit. The wars, not offset. Medicare Part D prescription drug program, not paid for, just added to the deficit, as was the general growth and development of uh, our federal government, particularly as the Homeland Security Department grew. So uh, I guess where's the good news? The good news is we actually reinstituted a big chunk of PAYGO in the last Congress. I don't know if folks know that. Uh, that's why the health care bill was required to be paid for. PAYGO was instituted in February, and the health care bill didn't pass till March of 2010. So it had to be fully offset with revenues and or savings, and both were used. But we still didn't put the spending caps in place for our discretionary spending. The good news, in my opinion, is in this last Congress, we actually put spending caps in place and actually reduced spending in some of our discretionary programs. I would argue there were some draconian levels recommended at the outset, but at the end of the day, our discretionary spending allocations for fiscal year 2011 that we're living through right now are some $24 billion less than they were in 2010. And that's manageable. A lot of the programs that we reduced or eliminated uh, were actually on the chopping block for many presidents, but no one had the political courage to step up and make those, make those tough decisions. And I think both the, well, both the PAYGO and this recent continuing resolution that, that affected our discretionary spending are, are good starts. They're not enough given the chronic imbalance between our spending and revenues and this automatic growth we have in our entitlement programs. We are still on an unsustainable path where our spending is at 24 to 25 percent of our gross domestic product, our economy, and our revenues are at 15 percent. That's not going to work. It doesn't work in your checkbook, your business's checkbook, and it's certainly not going to work for your federal government. Well, I can tell you what won't work. We've had some interesting solutions proposed that I guess I'd like to poke some holes in and take your questions on. Uh, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, earlier this year, as we talked about, proposed taking a, a meat axe to the non-defense discretionary spending. We'll just whack away at those useless domestic programs like education and environment and uh, you know, the disadvantaged safety net and you know, all, public safety. Uh, we'll just whack away at those and make a big dent in our long-term issues. Well, sure, we could make all those cuts. Matter of fact, you could eliminate all the discretionary spending on the domestic side, that 14%. I talked about, if you remember the numbers I talked about earlier, that didn't even get a third of our current, maybe a third of our current deficit for one year. At $500 billion, we have a deficit right now of $1.4 to $1.5 trillion. So for people to proselytize in Washington, D.C., they're making this great dent in our long-term debt, they're just kidding you. It's part of the equation, but far from the solution. Some of my uh, well-meaning colleagues on my side of the aisle say, well, just raise taxes. The revenues are an all-time low. That's true. Historically, our revenues have been about, oh, 19, 20 percent of our gross domestic product. Just raise taxes. Well, that's also a one-sided solution. And I think withdrawing 25 percent, if you will, of our GDP through the taxes uh, would keep our government too large, crowd out private investment. Even some of the John Podesta's think tank uh, agrees with that and it would be much larger than our historical norm. And frankly, there's absolutely zero political will to raise taxes to that degree. It would halt our recovery in the tracks and I fear put us back into another recession. Well, we could also do the politically expedient thing and that's just deal with some of these discretionary revenue things you're talking about, Congressman Schrader. We'll deal with some modest reductions in domestic and defense spending, eliminate the waste, fraud and abuse, of course that is in the eye of every beholder out there as to what, what is waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, and we'll just leave for the entitlements for later. Well, I think that's irresponsible. I think that's absolutely irresponsible. I could do that. I could do that. I probably have a much better chance to get reelected next year. But I think that's the irresponsible thing to do. With the demographic shifts that are occurring, you know, the baby boomers have arrived. We've been talking about that for years. Well, hey, we're here. We're starting to impact the system in a huge way. And we're starting to crowd out all the expending that's out there. Well, we could do the Ryan plan. 
We could do the Paul Ryan plan. Uh, and I like Paul. I've served with him. He's a good man. And at least he put everything on the table. He didn't have to do that. And I give him a ton of credit for that. But he did not put tax reform on the table. He did not make meaningful reductions in defense spending. And he basically put grandma on an ice floe, gave her a check, and said, good luck, you know, when it came to Medicare spending. And I don't think that's appropriate. That is not the social contract our fathers and grandfathers made with us. So I think we need to address things in a more thoughtful, comprehensive manner, frankly, a bipartisan manner. We have to recognize that each and every one of us has a legitimate point of view. That's one thing I learned in the state legislature. When I was a small businessman, I knew I was correct all the time. I didn't have to listen to anybody else. You know, I had the solution. I was the boss of my little old veterinary clinic, the little tiny kingdom I ruled. But when you get out there in the real world and you're a bigger businessman, uh, or you're in the state legislature, in the federal Congress, you realize, well, you know, actually other people, they're pretty certain they're dead right too. And uh, frankly, you have to take everyone's point of view into account if you're going to come up with a solution that America buys into. And I'm also pleased to report that despite what you see on Fox News or MSNBC, there are people in Washington, D.C. that are serious about getting these things under control and, and finding a solution. You don't see us on TV very much because we're actually working. We're actually trying to do something. And most all these revolve around the seemingly forgotten President's Bipartisan National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. I had a gentleman yesterday morning ask me, well, geez, whatever happened to that? You guys ever paying attention to that? On the surface, it would seem not what you see on TV, but actually there's a lot of work being done on that. And that's the most exciting part of serving in this particular Congress, the 112th Congress. Uh, you've probably heard of the Gang of Six. There's these uh, six senators uh, that uh, come from both Democrat and Republican side, three each, that have worked very hard to try and implement some portion or some uh, uh, form of the Fiscal Commission's recommendations. And they've struggled. They've struggled. One recently has left. Uh, not enough reductions in his opinion. The gang of five has continued to try and find out uh, can we come to some solution. I had some good news on that yesterday actually. Uh, so that, that uh, frankly as a House member to have the Senate working on anything, that's pretty amazing. So I was excited. I have been excited. Devastated when Coburn left, but very excited. But when Coburn left, uh, the president and others got noticeably concerned because this is such a big issue and people in D.C. do get it. Uh, and he asked for Vice President Biden to lead a group, a group of the leaders, if you will, of the uh, four corners of our building, you know, Democrat, Republican, House and Senate. Uh, unfortunately, I personally have little faith in that group. Uh, as a rank and file member and a person having served in our state legislature, oftentimes your leadership is more beholden, in my humble opinion, to the special interest influence. It's part of how they get to be in leadership. And uh, they also have to wave the flag back home and talk to their respective constituencies. And I think that's a huge problem. And as a result, the word leaking out from their discussions is they're talking maybe about a trillion dollars in savings over the next few years, and it's probably only in the discretionary arena. I doubt if they're going to actually tackle uh, the entitlements or tax reform. I also belong to a, a small group of Democrats that are very committed to fiscal reform called the uh, Blue Dogs. Uh, we have tried to you know, encourage this discussion in our own little tiny corner of the universe. There's only 25 of us. So out of 435 members, one can have limited influence. Uh, but I felt, uh, as chairman of their Fiscal Responsibility Task Force, that we should make some sort of statement to encourage the Paul Ryans of the world to step up, to encourage the Chris Van Hollens on the Democratic side to, to meet him uh, partway down the line as far as this big debt and deficit discussion. So we put out our own uh, uh, recommendations, kind of a, a, a blueprint, if you will, based largely on the Fiscal Commission benchmarks, uh, trying to get back to 2008 spending levels in a thoughtful, responsible way, reducing our deficits by $4 trillion over the next 10 years, actually getting our debt back to 60 percent of gross domestic product. This is an inter international standard that, that is a, a place where you have to be at least to be responsible and hopefully we'll get it further. And most importantly, that everything would be on the table. 
If you know blue dogs, they're not usually real excited about talking about tax reform or defense spending reductions. But these folks stepped up and are willing to bite the bullet along with everybody else. So what is this uh, national commission I've been talking about? What, what actually is in their recommendations? Well, it's actually a menu. It's not that proscriptive, although they give very specific examples of where they would make reductions, things that we could use as your congressional representatives uh, to get a, a handle on where we are and what we need to be doing. Uh, they also operate with several principles, uh, principles that I agree with. First, uh, you know, make sure you don't harm the recovery before making drastic reductions to either discretionary domestic and defense programs or you know, get onto our uh, long-term entitlement and tax reform programs, uh, make sure the recovery is on solid footing. And I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we can make some down payments like we did in the CR, but we've got to be very careful at this point. And therein lies a big contention between the Republicans and the Democrats right now. But the good news is we're not arguing about do you or do you not do it, it's only timing. And I'm hopeful that calmer heads would at least prevail. It also talks about everyone taking a haircut. As I said, this, we're all in this together. It talks about reducing tax rates, simplifying the tax code, making sure Social Security is there for the next generation, and controlling health care costs. It has the same targets, as I said, that the Blue Dogs have. There are six basic elements to it. Discretionary spending caps affecting both domestic and defense spending. Tax reform, meaningful tax reform. Additional health care reform, so both Medicare and Medicaid. Dealing with our ag direct payments, our food stamp issues, Social Security, and budget process reforms. The discretionary spending piece is pretty simple. Reduce spending levels to 2008 over the next three, four years, by 2013, 2014, and then allow growth at half the rate of inflation. You would have a firewall between domestic and defense spending, at least to 2015, to make sure there's equal reductions in both areas to respect the differences of opinion in this country. Tax reform, he had several proposals. They actually called out Senator Wyden's proposal, and I like that. But the one that intrigued me the most was the zero option proposal. And I had several big companies that paid virtually no taxes last year come before me and say they really like this. Uh, as many of you know, or maybe don't know, we give away as much in tax breaks as we spend every single year in our entire domestic and defense spending. We give it away. $1.2 trillion. Well, if we didn't give all that away, wouldn't we have some money? Yep. Couldn't we pay down on our deficit a little bit? Yep. Yeah, maybe we could even reduce tax rates. And the answer is yes to all those. Our current tax rates uh, could be almost cut in half, the 15% rate. If you got rid of all the tax breaks, you could cut our 15% rate to 8. You could cut the 28% uh, rate down to 14 both cut them in half, and even our high-end tax rate could be dropped down to about 25, 26 percent. Corporate tax rates could be lowered, and if you added a territorial tax system, we actually keep our jobs here. American companies would not be at an international disadvantage to invest in this great United States of America, because most nations have much lower corporate tax rates than we do. The, there's additional health care reforms. Uh, there, there's talk here in Oregon and in D.C. about putting the dual eligibles in one program, not have them in both Medicare and Medicaid. There's talk about ramping up our, our fraud, waste, and abuse programs, our program integrity areas. That could easily be done. There's talk about uh, revising Medicare cost-sharing rules. That has to be done. There's also talk about uh, uh, reducing uh, some of the uh, gimmicks that are used to, to manipulate the system. There's also talk, and has to happen, something about medical malpractice. And I'm not talking about $250,000 caps. That's not appropriate. There's got to be a smarter, perhaps safe harbor way to go, where if you're practicing within certain standards of care, you know, you get certain amount of protection. Medicare should be put on a budget, just like everything else. We can't afford some of our other mandatory programs. We've got to review our federal workforce and retirement programs give the Postal Service the chance to manage themselves a little better. They're restricted. We got to make sure that these payments to large agri-companies that don't grow anything anymore and never grew anything, or maybe 30 years ago, ago grew something, they shouldn't be getting direct payments. That's wrong.
And Social Security is theoretically, academically, the easiest to fix. And I've talked to seniors about this. I go to senior groups. Frankly, you only need to do three, maybe four things. And over a period of time, if we do it now, we can keep the benefits where they are. You know, we, we, you know originally it was set up where 90% of America's payroll was subject to Social Security tax. That way it was, was the way it was set up. Right now, only about 83% of America's payroll is subject to it. So if you just go back to the 90% threshold, you know, you gain a bunch of money. If you, uh, uh, I didn't know this before getting into this discussion, but you know, Social Security is already means tested. Well, if you tweak that means testing a little bit, you also get some money. And uh, unfortunately, social retirement age is now 67, not for many people in this room, but for new generation it's 67. If you tweak that to 69 over the next 65 years, graduate, gradually adding in a month at a time, I mean three generations, you do those three things, you save Social Security. And you, 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 could, and this, you could put in hardship exemptions for manual labor jobs st and stuff that, you know, obviously these people can't work till 69. But it's that simple. Where's the political courage to step up? We also need process reforms to make sure the next Congress follows through on this. Uh, discussed uh, discretionary spending caps and pay go. Uh, we need to switch to a more accurate inflation uh, parameter. We need to, need to uh, allow adjustment for caps on what we call program integrity efforts for saving money within the system. We have to have triggers and we have to have sequestrations if Congress fails to live up to its obligations. All too often, in my opinion, nothing gets done in Washington, D.C. I didn't sign up for that. I signed up to tilt at windmills with the best of them. And uh, I've lived a great life, I've had a great job, have a great family, and uh, you know, if I don't stay in this job because politics, I'm fine with that. I was hired to do a job. I'm tired of the demonizing that's going on out there. I suffered through it. We're beating the heck out of the other side right now. And I think that gives America the wrong impression about what we're about. It's no way to run a business. It's no way to run the greatest nation on earth. And I think that needs to change. So I think the Fiscal Commission has put forth the blueprint. I'm going to fight for that blueprint, and I'm working with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to make it happen, and I hope you respect that and like that too. Thank you very much for having me here. Before I introduce our Friday Forum host, if you've written a question uh, on one of those index cards, can you hold it up right now and City Club staff will come and collect those. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host, City Club Governor Pat McCormick. For 20 years, Pat was a partner at Conkling Fiscum and McCormick, a public affairs research and public relations firm. Now he is a partner in AMPMPR, a Portland public relations firm he recently founded with his daughter, Allison. He's been a club member since 1969. Pat. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Congressman Schrader. That was an excellent, candid, clear kind of look at what's going on in Washington, D.C. regarding our budget, and I think we all appreciate it. You mentioned that the economy would still be going down if we had not had the stimulus along the way. We needed to spend a little to make a little. Uh, and you asked a question about how fast we should have reined in spending. I guess my question to you, Congressman Schrader, is uh, given the sluggish pace of our economy currently, did we pull the plug too soon on the stimulus effort? Uh, that's a great question, Pat, and uh, I think many people uh, have, have talked to me and there's a big division about we need some more help. We need some more help. Uh, I guess I would, uh, I would say two things. Uh, one is uh, my belief that while the government is here to help, it's not the engine of economic growth. The real world is we cannot spend enough in government to really build our economy, and it's inappropriate. Right now, government is filling a void that private enterprise have left open. And frankly, that consumers have left open. Right now, well, it used to be consumers were 70% of our gross domestic product. Is there anyone in this room that thinks consumption is going to come back to 70% of our product? I don't, I don't think I got one. Otherwise, nobody. So it's not going to happen. So we need to boost private enterprise. 
And there's limited things we can do in a free country. This isn't China. I can't make the banks lend to somebody. So uh, it's going to be a bit of a slog. However, having said that, and well, also say that frankly, the current party in charge of the House is not interested in spending any money on anything beyond what we're currently doing. Uh, they made that crystal clear. Matter of fact, they've said that investment is code for spending. And it can be. I'll, I'll give my colleagues their due. It can be. But an area I would spend some money uh, on right now, and I know Congressman DeFazio and the rest of my delegation would agree, is infrastructure. We missed the boat, in my opinion, in the Recovery Act by not putting more money into infrastructure. We thought this was going to be a little... We thought this re you know, recession would be like all the others. Oh, we have a year or so, it's down, and it'll come back up at a, you know, the old, good old trajectory that usually does. Boy, were we wrong. You know, had to be a shovel-ready program. Well, we filled a lot of potholes, but we could have built a lot of roads and bridges. And so we missed that, uh, so I regret that. And that's something I would put money into right now, and I think would be a huge plus to putting men and women to work, particularly our blue-collar workers have 30 to 50 percent unemployment, back to work right away, our engineers, you know, get the innovation going and actually provide for a better economic future for our country who has to compete with rapidly expanding infrastructure programs in China and India. We will now take questions from the floor. As always, members are invited to the microphone over here to my left to ask their question. Asking questions at Friday Forums is a privilege of City Club membership. So before asking your question, please identify yourself as a club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash my trusty question mark card, it means that we haven't heard the question and we would like to. And at an appropriate moment, I'll ask one of the index cards questions. Thank you. Mike Litt, City Club member. As Robert Reich has pointed out in his new book, Aftershock, inequality of wealth and income is greater now than at any time since before the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, so that we have the 1% the, the of the population at the top of the wealth pyramid holding as much wealth as the bottom 90%. Low marginal tax rates on wealthy individuals are largely responsible for this, but not entirely. What implications do you think this inequality has for our economy and for our deficit? Well, I think that's a, thank you, Michael. I think that's a very good question, and I think it's recognized by at least progressive businessmen and women. Uh, I'm a veterinarian, and all I know is that unless uh, all boats rise in this economy, I'm pretty much a luxury business, so uh, I don't have enough people earning over $250,000 income to support my veterinary practice. So I need folks that are all levels of income to be able to have access uh, to my services and to help grow the economy. Uh, I think that it begs the question of why we need to change our whole tax system. Right now, in my opinion, we're engaged in class warfare. One side demonizes one side and the other side demonizes the other. And I don't think that becomes America. It's unfortunate, but the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. So let's get outside the box, and that's why I like that zero option thought. Let's create a new field, a level playing field. Let's start at zero, add back the tax breaks that we think are most important to protect our most vulnerable, to incentivize research and development, what we think, and have them expire at a certain point in time. So I think there's a smarter way to go about it, and we've got to get back, otherwise we're going to lose the middle class in this country. I'm Joyce Damanen, City Club member. Welcome back, Congressman Schrader. It's nice to see you again. It, was, it will be five years ago this November that Oregon voters overwhelmingly passed Ballot Measure 44, which expanded Oregon's prescription drug program to make it possible for anyone to get a discount guard to get prescriptions. As a result, Oregonians have saved millions and millions of dollars a year on prescription drugs. My question is, um, Congress has not allowed the uh, Secretary um, of CMS to negotiate prescription drug prices for Medicare beneficiaries, which helps them continue to pay the highest cost for prescriptions. Can that be done in this whole climate of trying to save money for the American people? 
negotiating prices, lower drug prices for Medicare be uh, beneficiaries, lowering the cost of the Part D benefit? Good question, and yeah, those are factual statements. Uh, Congress has hamstrung itself, at least in the near term, uh, in requesting additional rebates. But, uh, but the, it is a recommendation that is in the Fiscal Commission report. They talk about uh, looking at additional rebates, particularly at least for our Medicaid population. And I will, you know, again, I'm trying to be egalitarian here. Uh, uh, we actually, in the health care bill, no matter what you think about the health care bill, uh, we're able to get the drug companies to come to the table and provide significant discounts, uh, particularly in brand name drugs. If you're one of those seniors that fall into the so-called donut hole where your out-of-pocket expenses exceed, was it 2700 bucks, but less than 6500 bucks, or somewhere in that area, you got to pay the full cost. Well, we've got the uh, drug companies to kick in 50% of the cost of any brand name drug if you're in that hole. Uh, and we're trying to fill that hole in gradually over the next 10 years. Uh, there's also, a, I believe it's a 7% reduction on generic drugs. So we're starting to try and get down that road a little bit to provide a little more flexibility in the system so that we can do that. One of the advantages of developing new health care delivery systems that's being discussed in our state legislature, also at the national level, is you're going to have medical groups you know, made up of hopefully medical home, emphasizing primary care, access to specialists in the smart way you're supposed to go about it. And I suspect that there will be additional restrictions about the, how, their uh, how their purchasing power will play out. They'll actually be able to negotiate some of the you know, lower cost drugs because there'll be purchasing power under the health care bill that we do not have. We have now somewhat in Oregon to the, drug, to the program you talked about that I helped actually get going many years ago. So hopefully we're on the road to slowly but surely getting at exactly that. Ray Polani, a City Club member. You have mentioned several times in your uh, speech about uh, military spending and the wars. Uh, it seems to me that this is the most important, the most effective, and the most responsible way of addressing the debt. And uh, my question is, will the president, who is the commander in chief, and will the Congress continue to draw down and bring the troops home and end our foreign investments, which I think in the long analysis will make us safer? Uh, thanks, Ray. I actually believe so. The re last week, uh, the votes I alluded to uh, on our involvement in Libya give me great hope that uh, we're actually going to you know, get out of Iraq, like we talked about, that we're, we're done. Actually, frankly, if I listen to the uh, president of uh, uh, that nation, they, they, they don't want us there anymore. Gates keeps asking him, are you sure you want us to leave? I wish he quit, quit asking that question. Uh, but he keeps saying, yeah, please leave. And so I feel very confident we'll be out of Iraq by the end of this year. I mean totally out of Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan, tougher. Uh, I'm actually one of those that wants to get out now. Uh, now meaning with a responsible drawdown of our warriors to make sure they're protected and the country has a chance. But, uh, you know, this is a tribal nation that has all sorts of political machinations going on. Uh, our friend Pakistan is maybe not exactly our friend uh, in many areas. Uh, and they haven't, the corruption is rampant. They have not hit any of the principles that the president set out a year and a half ago. So. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we have a great chance because of uh, that nation's inability to meet any of our benchmarks uh, to get out of there. If the British couldn't do it, the Russians couldn't do it, Alexander the Great couldn't do it, I don't think we're going to conquer Afghanistan. And it doesn't get at the Al-Qaeda problem. They're all over the place. I uh, think we have to do a more targeted approach there. And the other piece on the defense is not just the wars. I mean, I'm talking about the contracting. When asked, uh, uh, when the Defense Department was asked, well, how many civilian contractors do you have? They said, well, we think somewhere between a million and 10 million. That's a pretty big number. You know, where, where are you? That's, a, that's, you know, you, you, that's irresponsible. And the, the budget has been called unauditable. You can't even audit the bloody budget. And the weapons procurement programs are out of control. We made some down payments last Congress on getting them under control. Uh, however, there are congressional districts where defense, you know, industry is a big, big, big employer, and they fight that tooth and nail. 
Uh, but I think this president, Secretary Gates, hopefully uh, soon to be Secretary Panetta, will follow in being very tough on their own department and looking for responsible reductions, not to just put into other defense programs, but to pay down on our debt and deficit. Hi, Jack Herbert, City Club. Um, most Americans want better regulation of our financial institutions because of what they did to us. And uh, the Korea Free Trade Agreement will prevent that. You've said you favor it, and you told the, yet you told the Oregon Working Families Party that you would have great difficulty in voting for it if, with those kind of provisions in it, and they haven't been taken out. So don't you need to reconsider and not vote for it until a whole bunch of things like that, and including that, get fixed? Thank you. Well, uh, when we were talking about the Korea Free Trade Agreement, uh, some changes had not been made that have been made. Uh, that agreement's been worked over dramatically. It is no longer a NAFTA-style agreement that ships jobs overseas. It actually helps us ship products and produce overseas, things built and made or grown in this country. I've done a lot of work, thanks to uh, folks like the gentleman uh, in looking at that agreement. And I can tell you this, as I said a moment ago, domestic consumption is not coming back to that 70% level. So we've got to find someone else to buy our products if domest domestic spending uh, consumption, excuse me, isn't going to get there. And the President's committed to doubling our exports over the next several years. So we need to have fair trade agreements or we're going to be left behind. It's that simple. If no trade is the mantra of this country, we can kiss our recovery goodbye. We can kiss our our future, our kids' future goodbye. Uh, that agreement uh, has been worked over. I have actually specifically looked at the language regarding investments and reinvestments and ability of different foreign nationals to sue our government. There's specific wording in that document that makes sure that no foreign national has any greater right than any American citizen, either in this country or abroad. The environmental standards have been beefed up. The core labor standards that our labor unions deserve and want in the agreement are there. There's enforcement language to make sure we actually follow through and can abrogate this agreement if the Koreans do not live up to the agreements they've talked about. And I've yet to talk to uh, an industry sector that does not think that the changes that have been made since that agreement was originally conceived are not of huge benefit. I met with the Korean uh, ambassador uh, and uh, talk with some of the industries. Right now, we face a 13% average, 13% tariff to sell our products into Korea. Right now, they have a 3% average tariff to get their products here. You know, it's pretty obvious to me we're going to be net winners at the end of the day. And if we don't consume, there's not going to be any jobs. If we don't trade, there's not going to be any jobs. We have to make sure that we look at these agreements fairly. Colombia, Panama, different situation. Colombia in particular, there's serious human rights issues that I have problems with uh, in terms of that agreement. But uh, we have to make sure all boats rise. And the future of this world and this country is in international trade and making sure that we protect American jobs and give us a chance to compete. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, banks. Well, yeah, the Dodd-Frank bill did a little of that. Matter of fact, we did such a good job with the Dodd-Frank bill that uh, the banks now are pushing back in a, well, I'll say banks. It's not like the banks we have here in Portland or our community banks. These are the big Wall Street investment behemoths. You're, you know, the, these guys that actually, I think, help speculate us into part of this problem. Uh, but the Dodd-Frank bill does a great job. I was afraid that when that came to the floor, well, I actually, I voted against the House version because it, I, it was too weak. You know, there's no personal responsibility on each and every one of us or limited. And the uh, ability for the banks to mix the money, your deposits with their investment schemes, was egregious. We couldn't get, in my opinion, Glass-Steagall back in the bill, but we did put in some protection for proprietary spending and some different limits. And I uh, guess we made a difference, because in my agriculture committee, the only bill we've put out so far by the Republican majority over every single Democrat's opposition, and usually my, my committee is a bipartisan committee, we vote things out bipartisanly, but the vote was to delay the regulations another three years. So that gives us more time to be at the behest of these. Wall Street has recovered. Wall Street is doing fine, folks. How about Main Street? Not so good. 
not so good. And I don't begrudge, I'm glad my 401k, if you will, is looking a heck of a lot better. But we have to make sure that we have a sustainable growth. This, this holy grail of liquidity needs to be looked at very closely. Just to have more money in the system and spreading around without making something in this country is wrong. So we've got to have that balance. And the Dodd-Frank Act, I think, goes a long way. And when it's fully implemented, the oil prices you see going up like this, because one speculator is chasing another, when they see that's a shadow game and the supply of oil is almost undiminished, even with the Libyan conflict, I think we're going to get our oil prices down and, frankly, be a little more reality in how we invest our resources in this country. I'm David DeMarkey. I'm a City Club member. Uh, thank you for coming to see us today, uh, Congressman Schrader. Uh, throughout your uh, presentation, you've said you've talked about tax reform um, and, and so had the Fiscal um, Commission. Uh, however, Americans for Tax Fairness, uh, to whose program almost the entire uh, Republican side of the House of Representatives uh, subscribes, has stated that any kind of tax reform amounts to tax increases and those are absolutely out of the question. In that kind of environment, how can we possibly pass these reforms? Good question, very fair question. And I'm not an expert on all the different uh, proposals out there because there's the fair tax, the uh, medium tax, the, you know, this beats the other tax proposal. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of folks have taken this no tax pledge. Uh, well, I, I tell you, I've talked with folks and while there are people like at this point, Congressman Ryan and uh, Majority Leader Cantor that uh, do not want you know, any sort of tax increase, I mean, user fees to these guys is a tax increase. And we face that a little bit in our own state legislature, and that's unfortunate. But I've talked with Tea Party members, newly elected, fully authorized Tea Party members in this Congress, in my House of Representatives, uh, and they are ready to talk about it. The tax rate reductions, the tax rate reductions actually are attractive to them. They think that uh, that is reasonable. And that does not violate their pledge. Matter of fact, uh, I talked to Erskine Bowles uh, about, you know, what's the effect of your tax rate changes and the tax breaks, getting rid of most of the tax breaks. Well, it, it actually reduces uh, uh, this, the uh, tax, uh, the, the amount of money we're spending uh, by 98 percent. 98 percent. It goes down to deficit reduction. I think it's 95, maybe it's 90, 95 to 98 percent of the revenue that's saved goes to deficit reduction. I think that's a pretty good Republican message. Almost all that, only 5 percent or 3 percent goes into boosting up the programs and stuff. So I think if you're a, a, a God-fearing Republican that wants to be clear on my tax message, I think you can vote for the tax rate reductions and still live and look at your constituents and make your case. I'm going to ask one last question on behalf of an audience member. Um, one of the things that worries a lot of uh, Americans is what to do about the housing crisis and all the foreclosures and it doesn't seem like any progress is being made on that front and what would you have to say about that? What suggestions? Well, I wish I had my uh, magic wand out, Sharon. That would be the the best answer. That is the biggest drag, in my opinion, on our economy right now. Uh, without the housing sector, real estate sector getting back into gear, I think we're in for a bit of a slow, slow recovery over the next uh, several years. Um, I spent a lot of time in uh, the last Congress, and my office has a whole new book of business on foreclosures and trying to help people that, through no fault of their own, uh, are in the process of losing their home. And uh, be honest, uh, a lot of the programs that have been proposed by Treasury or housing and passed by the Congress have met with mixed reviews. Uh, we've been able to help maybe, I think, a, a fifth of the people that we originally had hoped with some of our housing programs. Instead of three or four million, it's, you know, 700,000 or in that range. Uh, this isn't China. We can't force the banks to lend. Uh, we apparently have limited leverage with some of the regulators that prevent our banks and our credit unions from doing what they want to do. I had a community bank come into my office with several folks saying, Kurt, I want to lend to these guys. I know they've been good. I know them. Remember the old days when you knew your banker and your banker could approve the loan right there? Well, they don't have that option anymore. It's all big banks now. 
It's all big banks. So uh, he said, Kurt, I'd like to make those loans. I know I can make money on it. But if I do that, the regulators come in, they'll shut me down, they'll cause me problems, I can't go there. So we've got a real problem. I don't know if I, I don't think there is a real simple answer. Uh, there are some things you can do. Uh, one of the one, bills I signed on to recently, for instance, is to require all short sales uh, to have an answer within 45 days. You know, right now, you go on for a year. It's crazy. Uh, I'm also signing on to a bill that talks about making fair valuations. Right now, your home that is fully paid for, you're making the payments, nice home, is compared to foreclosed and short sale homes. That's wrong. You have people coming in to do the valuations that are well-intentioned, but they're not from your geographic area. They don't know the comps. They don't know how to do that. And we're also talking about giving banks some more room, uh, legislatively, unfortunately, having to allow them to do the more leverage I was just talking about. We prefer to do that administratively because it's a little more flexible given different economic situations. So those types of targeted interventions, I think, are what you're going to see going forward. Uh, I'll just put a pitch in. There's also in the back a, a, a proposal to uh, disband Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you know, privatize them. Disband is the wrong word. Privatize them. And uh, I've heard almost to a man and a woman in the housing industry and real estate and, and frankly, those that are in the Treasury, that would be the wrong thing to do. Uh, those do, while they're way overextended at this point, they are sort of keeping our housing market from completely imploding. And we need to divest ourselves, i.e., of those to some degree. And that's the interest rates are starting to go up. There are some down payment requirements that are being elevated to, for more responsible purchases, but they're doing it so they don't stall out whatever little tepid you know, recovery we're seeing, not necessarily in Portland right yet, but in other parts of the country, the housing recovery. So I think we have to be very smart about how we divest ourselves and what role those two uh, uh, you know, uh, government slash private agencies uh, play in going forward. We've run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Please join us next week on June 17th for City Club's annual meeting. And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation again to today's guest, Congressman Kurt Schrader. We're adjourned.